Welcome to Clarifying Catholicism's Science of Catholic Teaching. In this series, we examine the Church's teachings on marriage and sexuality from a scientific perspective. Most of the studies cited in this series were compiled in Father Robert Spitzer's The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, a defense of her controversial moral teachings, and they can be found in the description. Without further ado, on to the show. Last episode, we explored the sexual revolution's effects on American society, specifically on the downfall of relationships between men and women. We discussed how the experiment of divorcing sex from its procreative and relational nature had some pretty negative side effects. This, coupled with the commercialization of sex in advertising and pornography, led to a shallow, immature view of sexuality and, by extension, marriage. Throughout this series, we've been referencing Father Spitzer's four levels of happiness. Level 1, materialistic pleasure. Level 2, ego comparative. Level 3, contributive empathetic. And level 4, transcendent faith-based. Spitzer's thesis is that relegating sex as a tool for pleasure gets us stuck in the first two levels and inhibits our emotional development. What have been the consequences of this? First of all, in the past, procreation meant commitment. Giving yourself to another person in marriage meant surrendering your personal desires to theirs and ultimately to your children's. It's the ultimate manifestation of selflessness. With the popularization of the birth control pill came the divorce between sex and the inherently selfless expression of procreation. As society abandoned sex's inherently creative nature, it also abandoned the commitment that comes with it. This has been manifest in skyrocketing divorce and infidelity rates. Furthermore, a society that no longer holds sex as a sacred commitment between two people for the rest of their lives, coupled with a hypersexualized culture, risks unintentionally encouraging sexual exploitation of each other. This is seen in the alarming increases of rape and sexual assault. The irony in all this is that while the sexual revolution was touted by many as a program of liberation, especially for women, it is women who have felt the greatest sting of its negative effects. As cataloged by author Mary Eberstadt in her book, Adam and Eve After the Pill. Last episode, we talked about infidelity. Today, we'll take a look at another type of extramarital activity, premarital sex. Now, I'd like to restate a disclaimer I gave at the beginning of this series. While statistics can help us understand people and make generalizations, people are not just numbers. If I say that 90% of people who take a certain medicine will be harmed by it, there's still a whole 10% of people who may be cured by it. We're talking about very personal decisions people make here, and what works for the majority of the population might not necessarily work for the minority of that group. Furthermore, every person's situation is different. If I say that a majority of couples who cohabitate risk divorce, there's still a percentage of the group that doesn't, even if it is a minority. Also, abiding by the church's teachings on every single issue is very difficult. If we obsess over an issue like pornography but neglect to treat people kindly, or we let ourselves become bitter at the world, we're not taking a holistic approach to this whole Christianity thing. I've met some same-sex attracted people who are more virtuous than people I've met who are in religious life. So when we look at the data in this series, we need to bear in mind that sexual ethics is just one branch of the church's teachings, and we cannot treat people who violate them as morally inferior to us, since we all have our own issues. With that out of the way, let's begin. Premarital sex, and extramarital sex in general, is condemned several times in the Old Testament, mostly in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. According to Old Testament law, a man may take several wives, though such a practice was arguably framed in a critical light. Looking at you, Kings David and Solomon. The Catholic Church believes that God gradually taught his law over the course of history until it was fully revealed by Jesus Christ. Think of the Old Testament law being the rules you'd give high school kids. You're entrusting them with certain responsibilities they can handle, and your expectations of them are proportionate to their maturity. Jesus' incarnation was like graduating from college. As of that moment, you've been fully formed as a functioning adult, and thus you are expected to behave as one. So, no more multiple wives, says Jesus. Additionally, just looking at a woman the wrong way counts as adultery. 
So what does Jesus say about premarital sex? Explicitly, not very much actually, though we can infer from his emphasis on the permanency of marriage as well as its exclusivity and procreative nature, which he cites Genesis to justify, that it's not a good thing to do. Now, the New Testament does mention the term porneia, which is the Greek term for selling off sexual purity. It can refer to any number of acts of sexual misconduct, which would include premarital sex. Here, Jesus does have a lot to say, as he condemns porneia according to Mark and Matthew. So yes, Jesus does condemn premarital sex. Now that we've covered the biblical basis of the church's teaching, it's time to dive into some statistics. I must reiterate that these stats don't mean that every single couple who engages in premarital sex is doomed forever. I've met many people who had sex before marriage and stayed married till the day they died. Likewise, I've met people who waited until marriage and got divorced. The church's goal isn't to make you feel crummy or judged, it is to offer you the optimal strategy for unity with God and by extension fulfillment in life. More sexual partners correlates with higher divorce ratings. In 2000, the Center for Disease Control began tracking women who'd reported different numbers of extramarital partners. Within five years, only 5% of women with zero sexual partners before marriage had divorced. Women who reported just one sexual partner before marriage jumped to a 22% divorce rate. That's a 17% increase due to just one partner. The average for two to nine partners before marriage was 30% and above 10 partners was 35%. The impact that the number of sexual partners before marriage has on divorce rates is mostly attributed to attachment. When you have sex with someone, especially if you're a woman, you become bonded to them. Like, chemically speaking, the most powerful bonding experience you could ever have with someone is losing your virginity to them. With each successive partner, that chemical release typically decreases. On a different note, widespread premarital sex has literally given birth to diseases that never really existed before. I am, of course, talking about STDs. In 1950, the CDC reported 286,000 cases of gonorrhea. By 2021, that had risen to 1.6 million. There were hardly any reports of chlamydia until 1984, when cases were in the low thousands. In 2021, there were 710,000 cases. 2021 marked a record-breaking year in the number of new STD reports. I'm not even going to touch on AIDS yet. For now, I'll say this. A wise medical professional once told an audience that birth control might prevent you from having kids, but it will not prevent you from spreading disease. The only safe sex is waiting until marriage. The last topic I'll touch on isn't necessarily connected to premarital sex, but it often leads to it. Cohabitation. The number of people cohabitating has increased from 450,000 in 1960 to 7.5 million today. In an age of high divorce rates, one would think that cohabitation would be a great solution to give couples a trial run before putting a ring on it, right? Well, statistically, the opposite is the case. Couples who've cohabitated have higher divorce rates than ones who did not. In fact, a study by Michael Rosenfeld and Katerina Rosler argues that the longer couples cohabitate, the more likely they are to divorce. The reasons for this, they hypothesize, is that cohabitation weakens the resolve for a permanent commitment, undermines the esteem they have for marriage, and increases acceptance of divorce as an option down the road. Sherry Streetoff reports that cohabitating couples' separation rate is five times higher than that of married ones. Their reconciliation rate is just one-third compared to their married counterparts. Cohabitating couples are more likely to report infidelity and reported more abuse, higher levels of depression, and substance abuse. Even once cohabitating couples are married, they still experience higher levels of all these problems. Why is this? Meg J hypothesizes that cohabitation promotes a view of sliding into marriage rather than making a commitment to all the pressures that come with marriage. You're slowly dipping your toes in the water rather than just jumping in together. Cohabitation bypasses important conversations about living together, starting a family, finances, etc., and often just focuses on the more shallow parts of enjoying a relationship, like going out on dates, decorating together. 
this can severely impact commitment expectations between the couple. It also means that the couple, once they've had sex, might feel more pressure to get married when they really shouldn't. Spitzer mentions a lock-in effect that he compares to credit card debt. Switching from cohabitation to marriage is like signing up for a credit card trial with zero interest, only for that interest to spike to 20 or 30 percent once the trial is over. The couple is overwhelmed by the serious decisions they must make that they never really focused on before because they were caught up in the romantic fun parts of their relationship. Commitment, commitment, commitment. That's the name of the game. Remember that level three of Father Spitzer's levels of happiness is contributive empathetic, and many researchers agree that cohabitation can throw this level out of whack. A trend you'll notice in this series is that many progressive sexual ethics end up harming women far more than they harm men, and cohabitation is no exception. This is because women tend to view cohabitation as a step towards marriage, whereas men tend to view cohabitation as a way to test the relationship and postpone marriage. This can lead to a lopsided system in which men, in particular, feel like they can enjoy the fun parts of living with a woman and having sex with her anytime he wants without having to actually commit to her. This, of course, is antithetical to the third level of happiness. Again, the irony here is that Christianity is often labeled by progressives as oppressive towards women, when modernity promotes a culture in which men have no responsibility to women, can have as many women as they want, and can have unfettered access to pornography so they can objectify women, though that last part is something we'll talk about later. Christianity has always protected women, and women have by far the most to gain by promoting the church's sexual ethics. Next episode, we will explain the church's teaching on same-sex attraction. Until then, have a great day. God bless you.